Let's go back in time to 1932 as Converse brings you historic footage of the legendary original Celtics with whom all great professional teams are compared. We have now taken over your radio. Richie Guerin is about to show you the most important step in getting past a man. It's the first one. An Oscar will inbound it. The men in green, the Milwaukee Bucks, that's Al Cinder against Bellamy. It has Jordan. Allen shakes free. Gets two! Gilmore. to go in the first quarter for the Cow Palace. Here's Barry. Jordan. Open. Chicago with the lead. All right. And we are back on the Over and Back Classic NBA podcast talking about the uh, greatest 50 players in uh, NBA history. I'm Jason Mann. Uh, and I'm with Rich Krejci and also our uh, very special guest, the uh, man behind uh, ProHoopsHistory.com, one of the great... Uh, Pro basketball historians uh, who's uh, spe- been a special guest before and is going to uh, talk with us for a while about some of the uh, players on this list. Uh, Curtis Harris, welcome back to the show. All right. Glad to be back. And uh, we're going to talk uh, before we get into some of the uh, players, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, just kind of how this list all came about Um and um, it was announced uh, October 29th, 1996, by David Stern. Uh, there was a celebration at the uh, 1997 All-Star Game in Cleveland, which 47 of the 50 players uh, participated. Uh, it was compiled through uh, unranked voting with uh, by 50 panelists. There were 16 former players, 13 media, and 21 GMs, coaches, executives, 13 of which had played um, – had been players. Uh, players were prohibited from voting for themselves, although only three voting veterans who had played, uh, Bill Bradley, Johnny Kerr, and Bob Lanier, were not selected to the team. And 11 of the top 50 players were active when uh, voted in. So, um, Curtis, how? what do you think of the process to um, make the team, and, and how good of a job do you think they actually did? Uh, I would say the selection process seemed pretty good. Like you had like a, I read the list of people that were voting on it and they seemed, you know, pretty legit. They had good opinions on it. Uh, I would say the the fault in the process was from my uh, viewpoint was allowing uh, them to vote on active players onto the list. Uh, Cause I think it's really hard to, I mean, some guys like it'd be pretty easy, like Michael Jordan, like obviously he's going to be a top 50 player at that point. But I felt like a lot of people's legacies or whatever you want to call it weren't quite solidified yet. So I thought it wasn't fair to go ahead and like insert them on that list. Uh, Mm -hmm. When the people who were already retired, it was pretty easy to see that at that point they were, uh, you know, a top 50 type player like Bob Lanier, you listed like he I think he should have been on that original list. Um, But some of the active players, uh, maybe Shaquille O'Neal, who shouldn't have been on there, uh, took a spot from someone like Bob Lanier. Yeah. And and the the Shaq one's always the one that's sort of catches a lot of people yeah. by surprise or at least me when you look at that list is because yeah the guy's four seasons into his career and and yeah it, you could sort of extrapolate the rest of his career to him being a top 50 player and you know at that time he was you know unbelievable unstoppable really great but like you said the legacy was i mean what we got from Shaq for those next you know decade or whatever was just uh, it was almost completely different than those four years and it was it was just as good and if not better and it built up his resume but it still sort of seems shallow and and weird that after four seasons he's already you know in that list with the top 50 yeah. so i do agree with you it probably would have been better just to kind of say hey no active guys or whatever even if yeah you're gonna leave out you know a, a, a certain guys here and there you know jordans you know pippins you know a, a numerous guys like that, that are gonna get left out but i i agree it, it did seem kind of odd when you see some of those guys you know, there. And especially when you have like a little baby face shack, like sitting next and standing next to those guys. And it's just, it's bizarre, especially when they, you know, they do that lineup and everyone's got their jackets or whatever. And it's just, it, it's, it's interesting. It's odd. Yeah. It was a little awkward. Yeah. Uh, although I don't, I don't think Shaq was actually there. I think he, Oh, was yeah, he so not? Was, okay. No, I don't think he was. So it was yeah, 47 yeah. and 50. I know, uh, Maravich was already yeah. passed away. Uh, yeah. Jeff West was gone for some reason. And Shaq, I think, <laughs> one, too. And it was a wise decision because uh, I think Shaq would have got booed mercilessly if he actually showed yeah. up. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, that's right. Those are the three guys who who weren't uh, there. I, I think Jerry West. Uh, yeah, there was some sort of weird reason he didn't. I, you know, it's probably just Jerry West just being Jerry West. You know? Prior um, engagements. Yeah, yeah. Jer- Jerry West just not just wanting to be antisocial uh, is probably the reason. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess probably, probably the real most... reason. Yeah. Um, the um, I think the most famous snubs were uh, Dominique Wilkins, uh, Bob Lanier, uh, and and Bob McAdoo, who were the who was the only former MVP not to uh, not to be on the list. I mean, I I would say that um, I, I would yeah I would say those are probably the the three most famous snubs. And uh, apparently Jerry West uh, he was scheduled to have surgery for an ear infection and could not fly, so maybe he did actually have a really good reason. Okay, all right. Oh. Yeah, that sounds like a smart idea. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> probably went in very bad. Um, yeah. Sorry, Jerry West. We we're sorry for uh, the slander yeah. earlier in the show. So yeah, in case our, he's listening, which he's our like, apologies. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he's listening. <laughs> right. I'm sure he cares very much about our opinions on uh, on Top <laughs> Luckily, Jerry, we thought you mer- you made it already. We didn't, we're not even worried about debating your legacy. So you you got n- pretty much an automatic bid. So so go you. Um, so we, uh, we basically 21 of the players of the top 50, uh, we, Rich and I decided we're, we're pretty much shoe ins not really necessarily worth a, a huge amount of discussion. Although we did talk a little bit, there were, there were a few on there that we did have some back and forth about, but for the most part, you know, those are the guys who, um, you know, clearly were, you know, spent about five years as a top five player, 10 years as a top five, top 10 player. So we kind of figured, okay, they're. They're pretty much there. We don't need to go into them. But the rest of the guys we sort of divided up in is either very likely, likely, or or on the bubble to you know make a top fifty list as if, if we're making it today, including post nineteen ninety seven players. So uh, we're gonna go through them, uh, all, all three of us, and kind of um, and you know just just talk about their uh, strengths and weaknesses and their case and um, and so forth. Uh, for this show, we're going to uh, talk about the uh, the guards, and we will uh, start with uh, uh, Nate Tiny Archibald, who uh, we consider sort of on the bubble. Um, he played point guard from 1971 to 1984, uh, was a three-time All-NBA first team, two-time All-NBA uh, second team. Um, his advanced stats are he's a little bit low on that list. He's 129th in win shares, 193rd in win shares per 48. Uh, was a three time uh, three times uh, top ten in the league in uh, win shares. Uh, the other advanced stats basically uh, a similar case. Twenty uh, first uh, all time in assists and was the only player uh, ever to lead the league in points and assists in the uh, same season. I believe that was seventy three. Um, so um, so Curtis, what do you think about uh, what do you think about Tiny Archibald as as far as uh, being a top fifty candidate? Um, well, well, first off, I got to uh, call a, a little bullshit on Tony Archibald. Um, he is not the only player in NBA history to lead the league in points and assists per game in the same season. Um, that's one of those, it, like everybody says it, so like it happens all the time, but Oscar Robertson did it in the same year. Uh, it was 1968. Oh. Um, but like, it, yeah, like the way the NBA handed out, like, but this is why it like, gets it thrown out there. The NBA at that time judged who led the league in points. Like the, the scoring champion was whoever scored the most points that season. It wasn't oh, per that's game right. average. So, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oscar, he played like 66 or 67 games that year, but he led the league in points per game average and assists per game in that same season. So, no, no, sure. no problem with Tiny, but I just wanted to show that for Oscar because Oscar kind of overlooked it. Well, now Tiny is so thankfully off the top 50. Well, then we're, we're yeah. striking him off the top 50 then for sure. So that's, yeah. yeah. But no, but no. But, <laughs> Thank but, you for the clarification. Tiny, that's, uh, that's good to know. Yeah, no, but Tiny, uh, he's a curious case because um, he played really awesome for the, for the Kings, um, but the, the teams weren't always that great. Uh, they only had, like, I think two really good seasons in, like, the mid-70s. Um, and then he had like a really terrible Achilles injury and a, and he broke his foot too in the late seventies. So, uh, just like a three or four year period where he like basically just disappeared in the NBA and he got traded to like the Nets, uh, barely played for them. Then he got traded to the Milwaukee Bucks, never played for them at all. Uh, then he got traded to the Celtics and like his first year there was kind of just lost. Uh, but then he kind of got, you know, it kind of got up and going, which is just when Larry Bird arrived. So, um, 
yeah, his is a really interesting bubble one because his high was really, really high. But then he had like these four or five years kind of lost in the wilderness because of injuries and stuff. And then he came back at the end, you know, kind of like a sage veteran, uh, kind of was like a rock on those early 80s Celtics teams, which a lot of people forget. Uh, and he got a title with them. So this is the reason why he's on the bubble. Like, really good start, uh, pretty decent conclusion. But the middle of his career, it's just kind of like lost a big void. So um, it's really hard to judge whether or not he makes the list. Although I think he makes it, in my opinion, but I wouldn't, wouldn't be upset if someone left him off their list. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we found out in doing a little bit of research, especially advanced stat wise, is is he's hurt by a lot of you know not so good shooting as well. You know, among guards in his era, he, you know, he's second in win shares total, which is good. But yeah. then twenty uh, third in win shares per forty eight, twenty second in, in you know true shooting percentage. Uh, you know, among that same data set, you know, forty fifth in, in field goal percentage, and then you know thirty fifth in free throw percentage. So he struggles for a little bit from that standpoint. And like you said, the other big thing too is that that sort of weird career path where you have just those lost years in between that are just kind of stick out like a sore thumb, especially when you're talking about, you know, the, the elite of the elite and the top 50 of NBA players. He's interested. Yeah, we're, we're, we're sort of putting him on the bubble. Yeah, I don't know if we've decided who's in, who's out quite yet. But yeah, you could. he's one where you can make a, a real arguable case, you know, that you could probably remove him or, you know, at least if you have a, a suitable replacement for him, I, I, I think most people would probably listen to that discussion. Yeah. And, right. And, and I think, you know, we're going to find, you know, a lot of the guards from kind of the, you know, the, the, the mid sixties through the early to mid eighties are kind of have just a, a similar issues with, with the advanced stats. And I guess a lot of it is basically the, um, the shooting, um, you know, was, you, yeah. you know, uh, the, the, the shooting is a bit of a struggle with those guys. And I'm sure that yeah has a lot to do with how the game was different. And, um, and, sure. and obviously it's pre three point era. So that's, that's going to change things around, but you know, so that obviously has to be factored in with these guys, but you know, if we're comparing guys from different eras, it's, it's, you know, it's part of the conversation for sure. So, um, so next is uh, Dave oh. Bing, who we also, oh, no, you go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just one last tiny article. Uh, he was, he was exciting as hell though. So that, that counts in his favor. Like, um, yeah, you go back and watch some of his plays. Like this guy was throwing some crazy passes and dribbles and stuff. So that counts for something in my book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely, uh, uh, in definitely an exciting, um, uh, guy for sure. And I, I agree also, I think really the, um, the role that he played in those early Celtics teams. Um, I mean, I, th I think, you know, basically, um, you know, the, the guys who are remembered from those teams are um, Bird Parrish and McHale, and for good reason, but, you know, Archibald and Cornbread Maxwell, you know, um, particularly in those early teams are, aren't as well remembered and definitely, you know, and definitely should be. Yep. Uh, the next is uh, Dave Bing, who also uh, consider a uh, bubble candidate uh, point guard from uh, 1967 to uh, 78, uh, mostly for the Pistons, um, was a two time all NBA first team, uh, one time uh, second team, uh, 200th in win shares, not even in the top 50 for win shares for 48. So, so struggles with the advanced statistics. Um had one season where he was top 10 in win shares, uh, uh, two seasons where he was top 10 in uh, PER in the league. Um, uh, I actually got this from a tweet that you uh, sent, Curtis, is that he is one of the uh, four guards to lead the NBA in field goals made and free throws made for a season. Um, although he did it in different seasons where the other three, uh, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, and Tanya Archibald accomplished it, I guess, in the, uh, in, in the same seasons, but, um, mm -hmm. and maybe was, uh, maybe, a, I don't know what you think, maybe a little bit ahead of his time in terms of being a, a scoring point guard. And that there weren't others, you know, obviously Oscar Robertson, um, but, but maybe a little bit in terms of, of, um, you know, be, uh, being, taking a larger scoring role at that position. I mean, yeah, he's he's also he's really one of the um, you know we last I say you know decade or so like the you know the term combo guard was thrown out a whole lot. Uh, Dave Bing was really one of like the really first uh, combo guards when you think about it because he sometimes played point guard, other times played shooting guard, um, score a lot of points. You know, he averaged you know twenty two, twenty three, twenty five points a game a lot, but also averaged you know six to seven assists. So. Uh, he's he's a really hard guy to kind of pin down. Um, he he played pretty exciting basketball. Uh, you go back and watch some of his his film. Uh, he he played a you know fairly exciting style, but um, he got stuck on a lot of crappy Pistons teams too. 
Uh, <laughs> what, what his, it wasn't his fault. Like, he played the best he could. But, like, the team really, really sucked uh, for the most part. Um, yeah, and, although he, yeah, you know, he, just... he, had, he had Lanier was. I was just going to say, I, I'm a little bit surprised that those teams were so bad. I mean, I, you know, they had him in Lanier, and I, and I guess, you know, they didn't really have anyone else. They only really had one strong yeah. regular season um, in, in 74. And, and, you know, granted, they're behind some historically great uh, Bucks and Lakers teams as well for, you know, the early part of that decade. So that, it, it does make sense that that would be a harder, you know, uh, mountain to overcome it'd be like you know overcoming the you know bulls every year you know during jordan's uh peak so that that's understandable but it is interesting that you know that they never really were able to do very much yeah uh well yeah something to his credit or uh, i guess just to explain that uh like lanier showed up in 70 or 71 so being had been in the league for a few years by then and the pistons have really done a poor job surrounding him with talent um but then i, I forget what year it was i should have looked this up before but uh, he did have a pretty bad eye injury too, Dave Bing. So uh, he missed a lot of time with that and um, had to like, was almost you know, pretty much blind in one of his eyes. Uh, he recovered from that. That was like the middle of his career, but he recovered from that, was still pretty effective uh, for the next like three or four years after that eye injury, uh, before the end of his career, when he really kind of uh, went down the drain with like the Celtics and the Bullets uh, back at that point. But uh, he does deserve credit for that, like just uh, re- remaking his game after he almost got blinded in one eye. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's on the bubble for a reason, though. Uh, he wasn't even by his own standards of his era. Um, I don't think he was one of the most efficient guards out there. But <laughs> No. Um, yeah, that's... But, yeah, but but he was still pretty productive, though. But, uh, he yeah, he's definitely on the bubble. There's a reason why he's there. Yeah, and I did a little bit of numbers here real quick. Uh, l- looking at, similar to how I did Archibald, I looked at, you know, guards of his era, you know, when he played or whatever, and and he's really hurt out, uh, you know, by the poor shooting. Out of 52, uh, you know, guards of that era, he's uh, 42nd in field goal percentage and then eight, uh, 38th in free throw percentage, uh, 32nd in uh, true shooting. So, yeah, the, the the shooting definitely hurts, especially of his era. You, you know, all time, as we said, he's not even in the top 250 uh, when shares for 48, but then also even among guards of his era, he still, you know, struggles shooting wise, but yeah, he, he's one that'll be an interesting case as we kind of go forward and, and maybe look a little bit more into him and, 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 you know, figure out whether, you know, where he is, but yeah, definitely, definitely a, a strong bubble case right now, I'd say. Yeah. Um, anything else about Dave Bing? Uh, I got nothing. <laughs> uh, people like him. That's probably why he made yeah, it. Yeah. On the way to the mayor. Yeah. On the way to the mayor. Yeah. Future mayor of Detroit, absolutely. So, um, yeah. so he, he's got that uh, on his resume. I, I don't know. Uh, of course, he's. Uh, it's uh, things didn't go so well in Detroit for him uh, as well, mayor, but but that's not necessarily. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot going on before then too. So, given um, circumstances, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, we won't hold it totally against him, but yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll pass pass him on that one. So, uh, our next one is uh, Walt Clyde Frazier, who we. Uh, term very likely and um played point guard from uh, 1968 to 1980 uh four times all nba first team two times uh second team he was also um seven times all defensive first team um defensive first team or the defensive team started in 1969 so players before then will not um have defensive team nods of course worth noting in um in these uh, evaluations um 54th all-time in win shares, uh, 44th all-time in win shares for 48, and had seven uh, top uh, 10 uh, seasons uh, in win shares. And I I think that his production is especially impressive considering the team that he played for, who were, you know, definitely a team that, you know, shared the ball a lot, you know, kind of relied on like a, you know, a number of very good players and none of them necessarily had gaudy statistics, but I think Frazier's still, you know, um, stand out for his era and, you know, and are quite, quite excellent. Uh, Curtis, what do you think of, uh, what else do you think, uh, you know, you can add to, um, to, to his case? Uh, this man was just one of the baddest defenders um, to ever play <laughs> basketball. So that's, that's something that we, we know at the moment, like um, advanced statistics don't account a lot for, um, or we just don't have advanced statistics to really account for defense, uh, like how the impact the player has on the court. Um, and I mean, he 
I'm looking at his stat sheet right now, and like they didn't start recording steals per game until the '74 season. So that's that's half of his career. We don't have steals recorded. Uh, but like the first year they recorded steals, he had two steals per game. Then the next year he had 2.4 steals a game. Uh, that's him when he's like 29 years old. So uh, looking back like his days, like when he's 24 in like 1970, I'm sure this dude was stealing two and a half, oh, probably yeah. almost three steals a game. Um, and Willis Reed stole the 1970 uh, MVP award from him. <laughs> <in the NBA. laughs> That we talked about that not too long ago. Yeah, that was, uh, yes. Yeah, that was pictures, <laughs> but Willis Reed, like, missed a game. Then he limps on the court, hits two jump shots, and gets the MVP award for the series. When Frazier <laughs> won just, like, a demolition derby. Like, he destroyed Jerry West in Game 7. Um, like, that, that just, I don't think that can be overstated enough. It's just how great of a defender he was. Um, and that's to go on top of the fact he scored almost 20 points a game, almost six assists, almost six rebounds, and... Only half half his career recorded, but two steals a game for his career, and the guy hit fifty percent of his shots. So yeah, uh, I think yeah, just there's really oh, great. Ahead, when, you, when you just look at like the list of all time great point guards, like he is just I think forgotten by this point. Um, but he should be easily considered one of like the five best point guards to ever play. Yeah, there, there's not really any case, you know, looking at advanced, you know, even advanced stats, anything like that, shooting wise. I mean, everything is there. I mean, his resume is pretty clean, other than, you know, not being, you know, you know, he's 82nd all time in, in points per game. That's like a negative, I, I put. And like, that's not even a negative, like, that's all I could find because there's really nothing. I mean, the guy is is pretty much there. He never led the league in a statistical category either. I kind of put that. But otherwise, like you said, if, if we had counted steals, I like you said, 25 year old Clyde Frazier is probably stealing 2.5. You know, he's going to lead the league in steals. I guarantee it, you know, in one of those years of his prime where, so there's not, I mean, there's really, really nothing you can come up with him. I, the reason very likely, absolutely. I, I don't see any scenario where we bump him out or he gets bumped out by anybody. I think he's a shoe in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, agreed. Plus, you know, the fashion, I mean, that just puts him over the top. I mean, right come now. on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yes. The fashion. I mean, if nothing else, the hats and the suits, man, it's, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so next, uh, we have, um, we have Hal Greer who, uh, stays on the bubble. He, a shooting guard, uh, played some point guard as well, uh, from, uh, 59 to 73. He seven times was on the all, uh, NBA, uh, second team, uh, played for the, um, the 76ers and before that the nationals, before they moved to Philadelphia, um, Seventy uh, fourth all time in win shares, two hundred twenty first in win shares for forty eight. Uh, had three seasons where he was top ten in the league in win shares. Uh, was part of a team that won the uh, sixty seven title and was excellent in uh, sixty eight. But um, that team didn't necessarily have the um, longevity uh, that. You know, I, I do wonder if that he would his case look any better if his. Uh, if the 76ers had lasted longer as a power team, if they'd kept Wilt and, you know, kind of kept that, uh, Jet Walker and kept those guys together and had, you know, run um, into the 70s. So, um, I, Curtis, what do you think of uh, what, what comes to mind with Hal Greer? Uh, it's, a, it's a little of what I said earlier with Dave Bing. Uh, you mentioned it as well, where he, you know, played mostly shooting guard, but was able to play point guard at times. Uh, but definitely was more of a shooting guard and, uh, you know, he didn't just make seven all NBA second teams. Like he made seven straight all NBA second teams. Uh, he was just stuck behind Jerry West and Oscar Robertson for the sixties. So uh, that's kind of his problem there. But like, you know, seven straight years, you're called like the third best guard in the NBA behind Jerry West and Oscar Robertson. Uh, <laughs> I, I think pretty that, good. that really says a lot. Yeah. Uh, like seven straight years. And um, also like kind of with Clyde Frazier, uh, he was not as good a defender as Clyde, but he was a really good defender. Hal Greer. Um, and with the late 60s, uh, 76ers, that team definitely should have won two straight championships. Uh, and that definitely would have bolstered his case, which, you know, would be like two-time champion, Hal Greer. Uh, but, you know, we'll get into this later with Billy Cunningham. But uh, Billy Cunningham, like, you know, he had an injury in the 68 playoffs. And that's why the Sixers ultimately blew the lead against the Celtics. Like, uh, Cunningham was out for that series. But, um, you know, that's one of those what-if series. Like, if the Sixers had won that in 68, maybe Wilt would still be happy. He would have came back the next year and then... Uh, they might be going for a third title in 69. But um, as it stands, you're looking at it, Hal Greer, like the dude averaged about 20 to 25 points a game for almost a decade straight, which is a fairly long amount of time in any era, NBA history, but especially during the 60s to get a guy for a decade straight to get about, you know, 20, 25 points a game as as a guard. 
Uh, that's pretty impressive. So, um, you guys have him on the bubble, I believe. I think I would lean him a little. I don't want to say likely, but what's what's the difference between bubble and likely? What's something in between? That? <laughs> we don't have anything in the uh, bubble, unfortunately, <laughs> yet. But yeah, that, yeah. To make up um, something. I don't because I agree. That's that's kind of where I would put him as well. When I did a little bit of research and stuff and looked into him, I mean, yeah, he lo- he loses some in the advanced stats because of his shooting, but he's still. I mean, when we look at guys, like, we talked about you know being and in, in, in Archibald. Those were guys who were who were very low among their you know their their peers in terms of shooting. Whereas as Greer is in the middle. I mean, he's not like an elite level, but he's not terrible either in that in, in terms of like shooting percentages and true shooting and that sort of stuff. So yeah, when, when you add that in with like all the other pre, you, you know stuff on his resume that we talked about and everything else. Yeah, I, I would probably take him out. I'd, I'd probably have him somewhere in that. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have sort of that in between. We we maybe could have, but somewhere in that in between bubble and likely. I think he's one of the higher, if we're going to keep him in the bubble, one of the higher bubble guys. One of the ones I'd have the most, right. you know, it'd be the most argument to, to knock him off. Whereas, you know, guys we talked about earlier, Archibald and, and Bing, I think we could have him more of an argument. Whereas Greer, I, I don't know if there's a ton there to, to really argue or, or sort of discredit him on, so... All right, he's a high end bubble there. Yeah. Um, yes, high end yeah. bubble. There we go. High end <laughs> bubble. There you go. <laughs> By the um, end of this, we're gonna have like thirteen different categories. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, next, we have uh, uh, Sam Jones, who um, played uh, mostly shooting guard, although could could play some point and some small forward. Um, in uh, from fifty eight to sixty nine, <laughs> um, uh, for the Celtics was a three time All NBA second team. Uh, 95th in wind shares, but but 30 in uh, wind shares per uh, 48. Um, and um, he was uh, f- five times top 10 in wind shares, actually 10 times uh, in the top 10 in wind shares per uh, 48. One of the few players where they they have a major difference uh, um, in those two things, and, and the difference for him is because he had a relatively um, he averaged 27 points. Point nine minutes per game for his career, which is you know relatively a uh, low number compared to um, the other guys who are on this list. Um, and of course, he had ten rings in uh, twelve seasons. Um, was a uh, incredibly versatile player, and um, uh, and you know, uh, and, and as you wrote, was incredibly a uh, great player in the uh, in, in the clutch, Curtis. Yeah, um, yeah, Sam Jones. Like, I'm glad that him and Hal Greer came back to back because they they kind of show like a good case study of how a situation kind of dictates what happens in your career. Because mm-hmm. uh, Sam Jones really didn't get started in the NBA as like a full fledged like full time starting NBA player until he was 28 years old. Because um, he didn't get to the NBA until he was I think 24 or 25, and then he got stuck behind Bill Sharman, who was like an all time great shooting guard already on the Celtics. So he stuck behind him for like three or four years. Uh, then finally, in his late 20s, he gets to start and just, you know, be the shooting guard for the Celtics. And, uh, you know, it's, seeing how you know, his career was basically, you know, um, 28 years old till he was 35 years old, like that's the prime of his career. Uh, that's pretty unique, uh, especially for the 60s to have a guy like, you know, hit his stride and play at a the prime of his career when he's like 31, 32 years old. Um, but he had the benefit of playing on the Celtics. Uh, uh, he, clearly a great team. So. Uh, he himself would admit this, and uh, his teammates talked about it, where he loved to be a great player in the clutch, but he didn't want to be the go-to guy for an entire game. Like, he didn't want to be a superstar, didn't want to have that burden on him. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I've read books, and Bill Russell's been quoted in them, where he talked about, you know, like, he would talk to Sam and say, Sam, you need to take on a bigger role, or, like, you can do more than this, and Sam would just kind of back off and say, like, no, 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 I'm cool. Uh, but just give me the ball <laughs> at the end of the game. I'll take care of that, but I don't want to be the guy to, like, have to do it. To have to have it expected of me, like he, I think he liked that that um, the level of expectation on the Celtics, where like he could rely on Havlicek and Russell and Kuzi or Sharman, and then at the end of the game he might do his thing and then kind of fade back if he wanted to. Uh, whereas a guy like Hal Greer, you know, a lot of those teams from the '76ers for Wilt showed up, he had to go out there and score all those points for the team, otherwise they'd have no chance. Um, but but Sam, I think is yeah, he's not on the bubble, he's in because he did play on the Celtics and he got all those championship rings and. Uh, he did show up when he needed to in those clutch moments. 
Yeah, we have him. Uh, we have him graded out as very likely, and, and I have no argument with that whatsoever. I think you look at a lot of his stuff, and and a lot of it is you know the minutes per game is he just didn't get the minutes. So raw stats, you know, he he's not huge on those or huge you know rate stats and that sort of stuff. But when you look at percentage wise, you know anything you want to go per thirty six, you want to go percentage, you want to go anything like that. We said the win shares per forty eight. You see it right there. I mean, he's absolutely mm-hmm. a guy. It becomes a discussion then if you really wanted to, you know, we have him as very likely, but it becomes a discussion of you know if he wasn't that guy or if he didn't play that, but like Curtis mentioned, you know, a lot of it was, he just didn't have the opportunity. And when he got the opportunity in those times and in that, you know, he made the most of it. I mean, there was a big part of his career, you know, as you said, age 28 to 35, where he was a big part of that team, you know, 30 minutes per game plus after that, you know, that, so for me, I mean, it, it, we put him as very likely and I have no argument with that. I think that's a, that's a, a, a great, I, I think he absolutely deserves to be in that list and very likely. And I'd, I'd have, I'd have, I'd be hard pressed to make an argument against him. So. All right, uh, now we move on to um, Pete Maravich, who uh, we have on the bubble, uh, played shooting guard for uh, from 1971 to 1980, uh, two-time All-NBA first team, two-time second team. He is not in the top 250 for either win shares or win <laughs> shares for 48, which might surprise some people. Uh, he was three times uh, in the uh, top 10 for uh, PER in the league. Um uh, and was a, uh, a a great volume scorer, incredible ball handler and playmaker. Uh, had an iconic style and a lot of flashy plays. But his the the kind of the big negative is uh, for him is his teams uh, never really won um, during his prime. He did have uh, he was on the team for the uh, 1980 Celtics that um, they were very good. They did not make the finals that year, but they were uh, you know in. A, excellent team that advanced in the playoffs. But other than that, he never won a playoff season or only had one season with a, uh, a winning record. So, um, so Curtis, what do you think about pistol feet? Oh man, he's, he's one of the tough ones. Cause uh, he's clearly an exciting player. Like you just, you, you watch him and it's like, you know, one of the most creative players to ever pick up a basketball. Uh, but if he couldn't play any defense, that's a problem. Um, uh, he, he could pickpocket, you know, you know, uh, cut off a passing lane and stuff like that, but that's not a, truly playing defense, especially if everybody else on the team is uh, not in sync. Um, but I don't want to hold too much against him, though, because um, especially the Jazz, like the Hawks teams had a decent amount of success. Uh, like they only had one winning season, but they, they came close to having winning years. And those are pretty decent teams. But uh, you can't blame him for what the Jazz did. Like the Jazz traded basically the whole farm to get Pete <laughs> Pavich. Like, they traded everything they had to get Pete Maravich, and you got him, and it's like, well, there's nothing left, and what do you expect him to do with that except score a ton of points and the team not win a lot of games? And then they, they repeated the stupidity. Uh, when they traded for Gil Goodrich, they traded a whole bunch of other draft picks for him, and that just kind of put the team further uh, behind the eight ball. Um, so it's I find it hard to fault him for his team's lack of success when he doesn't control what the front office does. Like, they just made terrible decisions left and right. Um but then again, he couldn't play defense. He did miss a decent amount of games um, starting toward the end of his career and kind of flamed out uh, fairly quick after he, you know, left the Jazz. Um, so, I don't know. You, you guys are right. He is on the bubble. Um, it, it, it comes down to that question you asked. Like, is it, you know, does the, sub, or excuse me, does the style and the way he played overcome the lack of wins that his teams had uh, during his career? Yeah, he'll be an interesting one. Yeah, he he's one that I would love to, to for us to kind of devote maybe not not maybe a full show, but but part of a show and, and really dive into him and really look at him because you know just doing some stuff. I mean, obviously the field goal percentage he, he's also known as that, just a not a very good shooter. I mean, a volume shooter, but but Curtis, like you mentioned, you, you know those teams is really like well, we kind of need you to take like every shit because like who else is? I mean, there's no one else on that team. I mean that that's where you get that thing where you, you know I don't want to force. You know, yeah, he didn't shoot a great percentage. He wasn't a great shooter, but how much of that, you know, without knowing, you know, we don't have usage percentage stats going back that far or whatever, but you can safely assume that that guy, I mean, pretty much had to do most everything and use most of his team's possessions in one way or another. Just because they didn't have anything. They didn't have anything else. They gave it up to get him. So, yeah, that, that's where you kind of – but, again, that's still part of the resume, so you still have to bring that up. So he's an interesting one because, yeah, he does not grade out well uh, shooting-wise, uh, field goal percentage – real bad uh true shooting friend is bad and then you know obviously you mentioned not top 250 on win shares or win shares per 48 so so he's an interesting one where yeah it's gonna have to be probably a lot of substance and style that that, that would put him in or or you know at least be part of his case 
to, to, to leave him in, you know, on the list. So, yep. Yeah. But, yeah, again, I mentioned it earlier. Um, I already forget who was it. Tiny Archibald, that's what I mentioned about. But, yeah, like the, the, the substance in – or excuse me, I keep saying substance. Uh, the style. Um, that does count for something. Like basketball. Sure. You know, the, it, you know the, the way you play the game, the flair, the excitement you give fans that watch it. Um, like the NBA is a business. It is for entertainment. Um, so I think that should count for something. This guy was incredibly entertaining and incredibly talented, but yeah, like, like we've been talking about, it's, it's really hard to judge it. How how do you quantify style? Uh, it's really hard to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, but yeah, good discussion. Um, I think we'll move on to another guy with a lot of style. Um, Earl, Pearl Monroe, um, who is uh, another bubble candidate for us, uh, played uh, point guard and shooting guard from 1968 to 1980 with the uh, Baltimore Bullets and eventually moving on to the uh, the Knicks. Uh, was um, uh, only one time All-NBA first team, um, 155th in uh, win shares and 214th in win shares per 48, uh, one time in top 10 PER, um, and... Uh, did lead the bullets to the uh, 71 finals and then uh, was actually more of a reserve early on the um at least for a couple years with the Knicks and uh, then eventually you know kind of became more of a um you know more of a franchiser you know or starting level player um with the Knicks but um yeah I don't know he's another one that's kind of hard for me a lot, a lot of are uh are, are kind of hard for me um but uh, you know kind of a, another guy who has some some of the same strengths similar strengths and weaknesses to uh the other guys that we uh mentioned uh curtis what do you think yeah he's a tough one uh i don't know man i think he, he's definitely on the bubble <laughs> and he definitely had a a great style of play. Like you, I, I actually loved watching Earl Monroe play because when he, the way he would dribble up the court, he's kind of like would wind back and forth with his dribble. Uh, it's like the hardest thing to describe. Like I've never seen anybody dribble like him. Um, but you know, this like when he got his championship with the Knicks, he was a reserve. Like that, not trying to hold that against him, but like he was a reserve on the Knicks. That team was pretty stacked. Uh, but I'll, I guess I'll say to his credit, um, in the late seventies when the Knicks were just like a flaming pile of, uh, you know what, um, <laughs> he, he, he kind of showed up and was a pretty veteran solid presence. Like he was still averaging almost 20 points a game. Like he had a pretty good Renaissance in the late seventies when the Knicks were just trash. Um, when Clyde Frazier got traded to the Cavaliers and everybody else was gone and retired. Uh, and like Spencer Haywood was up there doing cocaine. Like Earl Monroe was professional. He was showing up and, um, <laughs> He was doing his job, and he, that's, there's some credit to that. Like, he was a flashy player in his early days, and then at the end of his career, he showed up and did his job at a very high level. Um, does it make him a top 50 player all time? I'm leaning not so much. Uh, I could be arguing into it, but he's, yeah, he, he's on the bubble. Um, but pretty exciting player, great nickname. That probably gives him more, um, I don't know, I guess I'm trying to think of the right word, but that is... People, I guess, think more fondly of him because he has the great nickname and played on those 70s Knicks teams, which everybody thinks are the greatest ever if you're in New York City. Uh, so I think he, gets a little <laughs> overstated. I think he gets a little overstated at times, but he is still a really great player. Um, yeah, that, that's my opinions on Earl Monroe. What about you guys? Yeah, for, for me, actually, he might have a better case if he didn't get traded to the Knicks, if he just stayed with the Bullets and had been that kind yeah. of that franchise-level player for like his, his whole his career. I think, honestly, that would, you know... Um, make a stronger case for me. I, I, I don't know. Which, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I'm right with you. When you look at, you know, stats and look at all the stuff, I mean, he has a big drop off those first few years in New York. And obviously we know the, the reason for that, you know, being a reserve or whatever. And then, you know, he comes back again. So he's got a weird career path where, you know, the first, you know, four or five years of his career, uh, he's, he's great, you know, a great score, all this sort of stuff. And then goes to New York, takes a lesser role, which, which to his credit, gets him a championship, does that sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden, then he, you know, the tail end of his career, he's back to what he was before, you know, a, a great score, you know, that sort of stuff that shows up on the resume, but there's still that period in between. And you, you, you have to count that. And even though, you know, he traded in or, or at least got team success and, and, you know, sort of traded in individual success, it, it, it's still part of the resume. And that sort of puts him on the bubble. And that really does hurt. I think, yeah, stays on the bolts for another, you know, seven years or whatever. Absolutely. You know, considering his production that we saw later in New York, he still had it in him. It was just, you know, being a reserve, being, you know, doing all that. So, yeah, it becomes an interesting case there. But, yeah, I, he's solidly on the bubble for me. I, I, I would I would pick, it would 
I, I would like to kind of look at him a little bit further and see, but yeah, I, I could see him getting bumped off. Uh, not fairly easily, but but with some decent discussion. Yeah, but there's just a lot of competition when it comes to guards. I mean, I mean, yeah, there's competition tough. everywhere, but it, you know, especially when it comes to guards, it feels like there are, and, and you know, more modern guys. I honestly just you know have the ability to have you know um, have, have a stronger case, but it, it's tough. Um, so next we have uh, Bill Sharman, um, who we have as likely. He was shooting guard for the uh, Celtics from 51 to uh, 61, a, a four-time All-NBA first team, three-time All-NBA uh, second team, um, 131st all-time in win shares, 37th all-time win shares for 48, so, so very strong there, probably surprisingly strong for a lot of people, um, and was a four times uh, a top 10 um uh, top 10 in the league in win shares four seasons uh, that occurred. So, um, uh, so, uh, so Curtis, tell us a little bit more about uh, Bill Sharman. Oh man, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you guys assessment. I think he's very likely. Um, uh, it'd take a lot for me to not have Bill Sharman on the list. Cause um, this guy was great shooter, uh, great defender. So yeah, when you talk about these two way players, like people I throw that around recently, uh, like Clay Thompson, like, you know, he's the you know best two-way guard in the NBA. Uh, that was probably Bill Charman back in the 50s, uh, best two-way guard in the NBA. Uh, he was tremendous defender. Uh, obviously, the off- offensive stats are there, so we can look at it. Uh, yep. This guy could, you know, lock up the other team's uh, shooting guard. Also got into a ton of fights when he was in the NBA. Uh, <laughs> nicest guy off the court. but like, How many did he win, though? <laughs> What's his win-loss in those fights? I have no idea. Like, I don't know if he won most of them or lost most of them. Yeah, but that, I've just that, that could be a big deal. That could be make or break. That could be make or break. <laughs> it, it can be. I don't know. Maurice Lucas will probably win. Um, <laughs> yeah, best <laughs> yeah, all the, the NBA uh, guys are going to make a, a big jump in this list if we uh, fight statistics are a part of it. But yeah. Yeah, but no, Charmin, um, he's – yeah, this is something I think gets lost too because it's just so long ago. But um, I think he more than any player kind of set up what we think of uh, one of the – we think of like a you know a prototypical shooting guard. I think he set the mold for that until you know later guys like David Thompson kind of took it to another level. Um, but when you ask a player like you know we need you to be able to to dribble the ball effectively, shoot the ball really well, uh, make your free throws when like the game gets down to the you know to the final moments. Bill Sharman was money like he averaged almost ninety percent from the free throw line uh, when he got towards the end of his career. Uh, again, great defender. So I think he kind of set the mold for what you were expecting of your shooting guards. Uh, so when you get to people like uh, Hal Greer and Sam Jones in the 60s, uh, they're building off of what, uh, excuse me, uh, what Bill Sharman was doing during the 50s. And, uh, yeah, I, I think just really forgotten about player. Um, another thing that I think you should get credit for is just the way he trained to play basketball. Uh, when his teammates like Tommy Heinsohn were smoking before games, uh, he was actually like, you know, thinking about what nutrition he should be doing, what kind of weights he should be doing during offseason, uh, running, um, so I think that should be, you know, giving him some credit, like just trying to introduce this model of, uh, you know, kind of nutritional professionalism when you play basketball. Uh, so I think that also should be counted towards him today when people take so much care of their bodies. That's really also taken off of what Charmin did uh, back in the 50s. Yeah, and you mentioned too, and, and he's a guy who, you know, as we started diving into the stats or whatever, it, it, was, it was shocking at, at how good he was and how efficient he was and all that sort of stuff where advanced stats – do enjoy, you know, they love him because I mean, longevity isn't there, and that's why the win shares, you know, you get 131. But you look at per 48 numbers, I looked at true shooting in his era among guards, he's second. I looked at field goal percentage among his guards, he's third. I looked at, you know, free throw percentage among his guards, he's first. I mean, he, he continues to come up as just an elite shooter, an elite level guy. Doesn't have the longevity of the others, but in, in that time that he was there, I mean, there, there's there's not many guys, there's not many guards better in the league in his era. So, yeah, he, he's a guy that, that, you know, we have him as likely, and, and I could see him bumping up to very likely. He's on the high likely side. How about we put him in that category there? But, uh, yeah, no, he, he grades out real well, real, real well. Oh, and uh, one, one last thing about him, uh, or I guess two last things. Uh, he also, like Sam Jones, started his career pretty late because he was, like, playing in the, uh, the minor league baseball system. So he got to the NBA in his mid-20s, so he wasn't fresh out of college. Um, and secondly, like, he, he was a pretty great teammate. Um, there's a story of Earl Lloyd, you know, the first uh, black player to play in the NBA. Uh, he and Bill Sharman were teammates on the Washington Capitals in 1950, and Bill Sharman gave him rides to practice every day uh, in D.C., which was segregated at the time. So 
Uh, I think that can, that says a lot for a white dude in 1950 to give his black teammate, the first black player in the NBA, a ride to practice every day in a segregated city. So um, that, I think that earns him some points, too, on the social front, uh, helping to change the NBA. So uh, Bill Sharman, all-around great guy. I think he's very, very likely to get on there. Yeah, I, I think you've made a good case, uh, definitely. Um, so next is uh, John Stockton, who we have uh, graded as very likely. He uh, was point guard from 1985 to 2003, uh, two times on the All-NBA first team, six times on the second team, and three times on the third team. Also five times on the All-Defensive second team, uh, fifth all-time in win shares, 13th all-time in uh, win shares per 48. I think his case is is incredibly strong. Um a lot of longevity and incredible production, you know, uh, one of the um, greatest, you know, um, career, career well, greatest career for point guard all t- of all time, but it, particularly in his late 30s, uh, was just able to kind of keep that up, uh, is by far the career leader in assists and steals. Steals was only tracked since 74, so if we counted earlier players, he might be lower on that list, but still, you know, an incredible mark. So not, not really any... Um, significant negatives that um i can find uh curtis what do you think um you did a good job of singing john stockton's praises um uh, so i have to admit i i hate john stockton as a basketball player um because <laughs> I, I grew up in houston the rockets were my team and i hated the utah jazz and john stockton hitting that damn jump shot in the 97 <laughs> western conference finals ruined the memorial day weekend so I have nothing good to say about John Stockton. Like, congratulations, he played 20 years, whatever it was, all-time leader in assists, all-time leader in steals. He's very likely. You guys gave him the good praises, but, um, yeah, I hate him. He just <laughs> – just, I just don't like him. He was great. Um, as, a, as a basketball player, a human being, but as a basketball player, I can't stand him. I hate the side of him. So, I think it's not very yeah. easy to work <laughs> So, but I, I can't stand him. He's a historically hateable player for sure. No, no, that, that's yeah. I, I, there's not many arguments you can make against him other than the fact that you hate him. So I'm I'm fine with that. I, I think yeah. that's that's perfectly fair. If that's uh, so a few guys <laughs> coming up on this list that I'll be able to 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 use that for. So I, I'm fine with it. That works. All right. Um. So next is uh, speaking of somebody people don't like that much. Yeah, I was going to say here he is. <laughs> there, oh wow. Perfect <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Get him out of here. I. Uh, I considered I, I did I did put him as likely, although I was very tempted to put him on the bubble. Uh, he's, he's very close to that. <laughs> he's level. out of my list. He's done. Um, he's he's a point guard from 1982 to 94 for the uh, Pistons. Uh, three times All NBA first team, two times on the uh, second team, 138th in win shares, and he's not in the top 250 in win shares for 48. Um, only once in the top 10 in uh in win shares first season. Uh did lead a, a memorable championship team to two titles and a uh, a finals loss. Um, another case of a guard um, who is, has a great reputation historically, at least as a player, but uh, the advanced stats don't really uh, match up for him. Uh, Rich and I have talked about Isaiah a couple times as far as, you know, kind of, um, you know, dealing with the reputation versus the uh, the production. But uh, Curtis, uh, how do you feel about Isaiah Thomas a- 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 as a player? Uh, yeah, he, <laughs> yeah, good, good, good qualification as a player. Um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> yes, just leave things unsaid. Um, well, he kind of has like an Earl Monroe thing going on where like he sacrificed a lot of his uh, individual statistics to help the team uh, reach a higher level of success. Uh, but I guess the thing that I come back to with Isaiah Thomas is, you know, I, I hate to b- do this kind of thing. It, it annoys me when people do this usually, but uh, what was it? It was game six of the 88 finals. Yeah. Game six, 88 finals when he like uh, twisted his ankle and then went on to score like 25 points in the last quarter or so of the game. Uh, and all, the, the Pistons almost won the game, uh, except for a really bogus call on uh, Bill Lambeer fouling Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, Pistons probably would have won the title if not for that stupid foul. Um, and that's because Thomas framed his ankle like severely, probably shouldn't have played on it, but still somehow scored almost 25 points to finish the game up. Uh, I think that said a lot about him, where like he could have been doing this all the while, but he figured it was best if he kind of took a step back in terms of his scoring. 
and um, allowed the team to kind of take on that mentality of being the bad boys because, you know, the first half of his career, the Pistons were scoring 100, 110, 120 points. Uh, like, they're the team that couldn't play any defense. They uh, played that game with the Nuggets where they scored over 180 points. Um, and he allowed himself to be transformed into this different kind of player. And I think that's – it could be looked at as bad, but I think it's a good thing where a, a point guard could be like, I'll allow myself to be transformed by this coach and Chuck Daly into like a different kind of player to a, lead a different kind of team. And when the m- moment called for it, to like go back to that old mode and score all those points, but no one to step back and uh, let the team kind of focus and run the way it needed to under Daly's system. So, um, so yeah, I think he, he, he left a little bit on the table in terms of stats um, to, to get the team success. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, looking at some stuff uh, with him, and and yeah, he's he's an interesting case, and he's one that we'll definitely, uh, I'm sure, have a, another podcast about or, or or talk a lot about is because you know compared with his you know guards of his era, not a great shooter. You know, 65th in true shooting, uh, 65th in free throw, 68th in field goal percentage. Uh, he scored well for his position, you know, did well, but it didn't do so efficiently. So there, there's an argument there, but like you said, there, there's or like Curtis said, there, there, there's a little caveats to that of, of you know. So there's always more that goes into it, but yeah, he he's an interesting case. He's sort of um, I don't know where to put him. I, he's he's not a very likely. He's not a bubbles. Likely is probably a good spot for him, but I, I think he could be one that we might have to talk a little bit more about as we kind of continue in, you know, on the on this you know top fifty thing and, and look at guys who we'd want to add to the list and 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 guys that we might have to remove and stuff. So no, he's an interesting case for sure. But uh, yeah, I, I I'm looking forward to more discussion and research with him. Yeah, for sure. So, and uh, the last of our um, of our guards for for this first show is uh, Lenny Wilkins, who is another bubble candidate. Uh, play point guard from uh, 1961 to 75, um, 89th in win shares, 246th in win shares for 48. Um, actually, did have he had one season where he was top 10 in win shares. In fact, he finished uh, second in uh, voting that uh, MVP voting that year, 1968, which is uh, sort of a, a little bit incredibly out of nowhere, considering he didn't have anything any seasons like that for the rest of his career. Obviously, was still a very good player, but just sort of a jumps out of nowhere. Um, uh, uh, as a, as a result, um, but was, uh, actually number one all time in the league when in assists, when he, uh, retired now is 12th all time. Um, so it does have some strong, um, has, has some strong numbers, but, um, the, again, another guy who doesn't grade well when it comes to, um, to efficiency, um, Curtis, uh, how do you feel about Lenny Wilkins? Oh, well, to be honest, Lenny Wilkins is one of these players I've had the hardest time trying to figure out, like, just how good he was. Because uh, he, he made a lot of all-star teams. But when I when I go back and read about it, uh, what he did when he was a player and how the players feel about him, the kind of sense I get from him is, like, uh, that he he was a really good point guard and really helped steady teams. And... But the later latter part of his career, like when he was with the the Sonics and the Cavaliers as a player coach, uh, really not a lot of people say a lot of things about what he did as an actual player. Uh, he still put up pretty good numbers those years, but those were you know pretty new franchises, so he kind of had just a green light to do whatever he wanted uh, on offense, especially when he's the player coach. Like he can do whatever he wants basically on offense. Um, but the most I've been able to find from him is in his early career with the Hawks in St. Louis. And the best thing they said about him was, you know, like Cliff Hagen and Bob Pettit were like, he gave us the ball whenever we needed to. He needed it in the right spot. Um, which, you know, that means that like when the point guard's able to get the forwards the ball where they, where they like it and they can, you know, score the ball pretty easy whenever, where, uh, wherever he gets the ball to him. That, that means a lot, but he's been, he's been a hard player for me to kind of figure out exactly how good he was. Um, not a lot of film on him. No, people, a lot of people talking about him except for Bob Pettit and Cliff Hagen loving how he gave them the ball. So, um, I wish I had more on Lenny Wilkins, but I, I don't, I don't have a lot on him as a player. It's hard to kind of get a handle on as well when, you know, looking at stats and doing that sort of stuff. You, you don't get a lot from him. He's sort of, he's kind of in the middle. You know, I looked at guards, you know, of his era, he's 17th in true shooting, 39th in field goal, 34th in free throw, 15th in win shares for 48. So yeah, he's, he's, he's not like, you know, he doesn't grade out poorly in those, but he doesn't grade out well. He's just kind of in the, it's. He's a hard one. I, I I can't really get a read on him either. Jason, I don't know if you have any strong Lenny Wilkins takes, but uh, I don't know. He's an interesting one. Yeah, I I, I, I couldn't really find much. I, I just, I don't know. 
Yeah, I, he, it's the same for me. I mean, he um, it, it doesn't seem like by the numbers he really has the case. I mean, he's one of the probably the first bubble guys I would I would say would would be would mm-hmm. go. Um, he did he performed well as an older player. Like, I mean, unusually well as an older player for um, his time period. I mean, at at thirty five um, for the Cavs, he was averaging you know twenty point five. Um, points per game um 8.4 assists you know on you know 45 percent uh shooting which you know is pretty strong for uh a guard for that time so you know he still he he did sort of manage to perform well late in his career as curtis said obviously for teams that were not very good and he was uh you know player coach in in those situations so um you know he, he was able to, i'm sure he put himself kind of in that position but still um you know he performed well but i i do think if you look overall at his career you know, unless there's something that kind of comes up in our research that, um, you know, really strengthens his case you know, in terms of leadership or whatever. I mean, obviously, he was a long time uh, coach afterward and, you know, is uh, one of the greatest you know coaches of all time, at least in terms of all time wins. And, you know, it's pretty well respected throughout the league. So, um, uh, you know, maybe there's that aspect to it. But uh, but otherwise, yeah, I, I kind of I, I basically feel the same way. All right, well, that's it for uh, Guard. So we'll uh, be back again uh, soon with another uh, couple other episodes with Curtis talking about the uh, other players uh, on the list and some other things uh, regarding the Tempest list. So, uh, so check back with us soon. So we'll, uh, we'll see you later.